Welcome to the burning of the midnight amp, where we are dissecting music history, album by album, and track by track. And we are starting on a new album today. We will continue on our uh, anti-chronological David Bowie journey, and I've come to his 22nd album, depending on how you count it, uh, namely Hours from 1999. Can I just ask, is it anti chronological when you go backwards yes that's the actual term or reverse, reverse. <laughs> reverse. <laughs> I don't know. maybe but uh it's a fun fun way of putting it not chronological at least <laughs> uh, unchronological yeah, yeah. um <clears throat> Yeah, me and Chris, we have already discussed this album at length in our podcast. We are discussing uh, how the album was made, the connections to uh, Omicron, the Nomad Soul, the computer game, which uh, many of the songs uh, were written for. Um, and how it is uh, maybe a transition album, or uh, at least the start of that period where David Bowie became more introspective uh, or um, looking behind maybe a bit more than he used to do before so he was mostly looking forward we could say and coming out of the much more experimental outside and earthling high energetic album especially earthling and here we land at something that is much more uh, subdued and uh, ballad ish more vh1 than mtv that's a good way of putting it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. He was making music for the parents and not for the kids. While Earthling is more of a rock out uh, festival uh, type of album. And this is more uh, uh, middle aged uh, music, not only in his lyrics, but also in the, in the way it is uh, produced and performed. And uh, for our uh, podcast uh, listeners, we are no, now joined by uh, Tron, who will join us for the listening session. So welcome, Tron. Thank you. I um, I have uh, listened a bit to this album before, and it was probably one of the first David Bowie albums I uh, really was listening to, and kind of, prob- I think it was a bit of an awakening you probably had to because we were sharing flat at the time. As well, that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know if it was forced or not. We will see. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so in any way, if you'd like to hear our discussion on the album, you need to uh, um, search up the podcast, The Burning of the Midnight Amp, of course. And over on Patreon, we also have the full podcast. We can view us uh, discussing this. And where you can get early access to all the songs from this album and future albums as well. So the first track on uh, ours is uh, the lead single, Thursday's Child. It was written by David Bowie and uh, Reeves Cabrals, which are more or less all the songs on this track uh, album, I think. And... uh, We're just going to go ahead and listen to the song and we'll discuss it afterwards. So here we go, Thursday's Child. So hard 
ballad it's a beautiful ballad we've um talked about starting uh, songs with bowie's later records mm -hmm. and now they have quite good starting songs and jumping at you and i don't know how i feel about this choice it's uh, it's a very subdued type of opening but maybe it f just fits the mood of the record yeah, I think it does, and it's a statement in the sense that, as I said, you come out of outside an earthling, high energy earthling, drum and bass album, lot of, uh, uh, say not necessarily overproduced, but a lot of uh, noises and sounds and mm. rough guitars, and you come here to this significantly different song which uh, also disappointed some fans of course who had uh, gotten on the, on the two previous albums it's a bit like welcome to david bowie's lounge album <laughs> <laughs> yeah i remember being a bit uh, disappointed of not this single uh because i like the single but the album uh, as a whole uh, because this was not the experimental noisy bowie this was more yeah as i said your your parents music uh, again um, but I think it's a, a, a wise decision to put this in the front of the album as it is one of the, as Ford said, it's, it's a big difference to the last album. So it's sort of a statement that, uh, well, and yet again, he is changing his uh, suit. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and with the cover, you know, we're new white uh, Bowie dressed in white with a new haircut uh, is cradling the... Uh, earthling uh, like haircut a, uh, like a dying man. beard yeah <laughs> <clears throat> he's cradling his last version of himself then uh, he could not have started with um, new angels of promise or uh, pretty things are going to hell or one of the more upbeat noisy songs he had to take uh, one of the pop songs this or survive or to to 
mark uh, this is where I am now. And uh, of course, it, it doesn't completely follow it up because uh, the album uh, skips a bit back as well. Uh, to it has some noisy parts. It's not all lounge, mm -hmm. <laughs> but oh. um, just like a transition. It is a transition, of course, yeah. and uh, it is the last album with Reeves Cabrels. But I don't think his guitar has been as subdued on any other album. I think it's very either. Uh, I mean, you no. see uh, the Earthling tour where he was Reeves Cabrels being very experimental, mm -hmm. lot of effects. I mean, this could be played by can we say any guitarists in a way. Yeah, it's it's more like it takes the back of the stage instead of mm -hmm. the front of the stage. And actually, at the, at the time, I, I thought that this change of style was the reason why Reeves Cabrels left David Bowie. Maybe it was part of it as well. But on the other side, he did indeed co-write all the songs on this album. And several of the songs were meant for his own solo album mm -hmm. originally. But we don't know if that was, was he told by Bowie? to kind of tone down his playing style? No, I, I think it has something to do with also the way the songs were written. Uh, as we discussed in the podcast, a lot of the the songs were written um, in Bahamas, uh, where Bowie was staying for a, while, for a while because of tax reasons he had. Yeah. Uh, um, <laughs> basically... Uh, received uh, back his rights to his back catalog and sold it again so he suddenly had a lot of uh, of money and uh, he was staying in bahamas for a while and and got bored and called reeves and bells over mm. to uh, watch movies and write songs and all they had were a couple of acoustic guitars so the songs naturally became less mm. experimental and more uh, mm. um, sunny yes <laughs> I wouldn't call it yeah. this sunny necessarily, but more more traditional songs, you could say. Mm. It explains the mood in a way mm. for the album. Mm. Yeah, well, there's a lot of good things to be said about this track, uh, and uh, I really like um, the melody mm. and uh, uh, when uh, when Holly Palmer comes in and they. They sing call and response, and it's, it builds mm. towards the end. It's it's very beautiful, mm. but still, there's you know something missing, and I think as a whole, this album is uh, one of the Bowie albums that uh, it's it's not perfect. It's not I wouldn't change a thing uh, as some other albums can be, but this is an album that you feel is you know it's. A bit half baked. It's almost there, but it needs needs something, some editing or some a new mix or overdubs or or and and uh, I, uh, maybe he felt that uh, himself because this is an album that uh, where he continued to make new versions uh, for the singles. The the survive was a completely different mix, and uh, seven was a different mix when yeah, there were at least the singles. Mm -hmm. And they also exist in this <coughs> different Omicron uh, Nomad Soul versions on the uh, computer game. The computer game, but mm -hmm. also on the uh, double uh, collection mm -hmm. came in uh, ten years later. So there's m many different mixes of these uh, songs. Yeah, it's it's actually quite complicated to um, uh, discuss <laughs> because I've also heard some of the other versions. Some cases I feel they are better, and other cases they are not. And yeah. I see on the "Nothing Has Changed" compilation, mm. they chose to have two of the remixes, the rock mix, yeah. instead of um, what is actually on the album. Mm. But yeah, I, I think like they they um, they did a new version of "Never Let Me Down" uh, a couple of years ago that uh, really bettered the album i think all tracks <laughs> and and uh, this is a uh, if i would to pick another bowie album that uh, should have had the same treatment to see how it would 
uh, if it would work. Maybe mm-hmm. it wouldn't, but uh, it, it would be in, is interesting to, to hear. Um, it would be ours. And listening to the mix now on headphones, um, I don't think it's a particularly good mix of Thursday's Child in the opening because it has this sort of cheap, tinny uh, production. There's the, the synthesizer. Keyboard the tunes are the quite uh, pr- primitive, uh, you could say. It's quite primitive. And that can be, uh, you know, it can work very well. But there's something about uh, the, the mix in the beginning. Um, it doesn't work that well, I think, for me. Um, and, and when he starts singing, he's, uh, he's very low in the mix. And this um, synthesizer string or something is, is um, lying on top of muddying out the sound. His voice is um, it's mixed uh, louder, louder in the mix as you go on. Uh, forward in the song and when holly palmer comes in and you know when he starts to uh, really putting his the weight into his singing then it sort of rises in the end and because in the beginning it's almost like he, he under sings a bit in the trying to be fragile type of voice mm-hmm. um, no, I, s- I see yeah. what you mean it's almost like he's uh, waking up slowly yes it's, it's like uh, a mime performance mm-hmm. but done with uh, done in the mix um, that I, I don't think suits it very well. I I would have preferred the opening to be mixed more like the ending. Um, mm. But there's also a different uh, yeah. mix called a guitar mix uh, from, uh, I don't know if it was a B-side. Maybe it was a B-side. No, the B-side only has the rock mix. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. The, just misremembering the name, the rock mix. Yeah, Yeah, rock mix, yes. And uh, uh, I don't think that works at all. <laughs> it's not a better mix, I it's would not say. A better mix. Uh, the, the choice of, uh, we will come back to the single versions later, but there is a single version that has the rock mix instead of the radio edit or the album version. Mm. And uh, yeah. I would say on the album version that it's too long, though. It is a bit long. It's uh, five minutes and it's over five minutes at least. Mm. 522 yeah and about 330 i feel like just okay it's, you heard you've it. you've told <laughs> the message single version yeah. is a minute shorter it's about 420 so yeah. it's probably the right right length makes more sense mm. yeah. i think you could say that about many tracks on this album yeah um, i'm i'm also afraid <laughs> that we can good things are going to hell mm. is at least 50% longer than it <laughs> has to <laughs> oh is it well we'll see yeah, yeah. I, uh, <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. So, yeah, um, mm-hmm. yeah this uh, song it preceded the album by two weeks, so it was the first song that was uh, released from the album. Um, and also, when when uh, being the f- opening track, it was also the first song we got a taste from on on the Bowie Net on the web page, where we released forty second snippets of each song, sort of revealing it gradually, and. Um, but do you remember, uh, was it the opening or was it the oh, chorus? Or I have no idea. But I remember when it came out that we already then knew that it was going to be the single. So so that uh, so that, that was already known. Uh, I remember there was a vote on, on, on Bowie Net uh, where you could vote on which song you would have preferred to be the single. Mm. And I think most people chose this one, uh, Thursday's Child. I chose another one, I remember, which we'll come back to uh, in another episode. But uh, but uh, at, th- at that time, I think it was only a short snippet of it that w- had been heard. Hmm. Um, uh, that was a proper voting process? No, it wasn't a voting for which mm-hmm. it was only to hear the opinion. Mm-hmm. It wasn't, uh, we didn't use that as the decision yeah. to what to release. Would have been a cool idea. As we discussed in the in the podcast, uh, there were different suggestions earlier in the stages of this song. Um, Boy would uh, have uh, uh, TLC as uh, collaborators and guest vocalists uh, of some sort on this track. Yeah, actually, the very first he wanted was uh, was a, an actual child. 
to sing uh, the Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday born part at least mm. because it sounds a little bit like an uh, nursery rhyme. Nursery rhyme. Yeah. And um, he it was offered to Mark Platy. Mark Platy came in during the process, um, played the bass here, and he ended up being Bo's producer later on. Um, and his six-year-old daughter Alice was offered the role to sing this. But uh, she said that she'd rather sing with her friends than with adults. <laughs> <laughs> so she, she turned, turned Bowie down there. Good choice. And uh, apparently later she <laughs> regretted it when she realized that her father was going on tour <laughs> with Bowie. And she believed that if she had sung on the album, she would have been able to go on tour. Yeah. But yeah, uh, I, I think that's the order of it. And then Bowie suggested TLC, which uh, Rhys Gabrels convinced him not to. And, and uh, he went with Holly Palmer instead, mm. which I think Reeves Cabrales had had some um, collaboration with very recently before this. Mm -hmm. But that's a, a different version of the song that never existed. But, it, you know, if he cho chose this as his first single and to put it, um, no, to put a, a TLC on it uh, who, where they were very uh, commercially successful at that time with mm. uh, many singles and uh, and uh, charting singles and uh, it, had he done it it would have been probably a, a bigger success mm -hmm. one could never know of course it could have been a laughing stock <laughs> of course yeah, but it could have been a flop it could have been a flop but uh, but still you know this is a track that you know tries to be billboard uh, commercial but but it's not so it sort of lands between the chairs to I, use I can't imagine a boy intentionally tried to make something commercial just for the sake of being commercial but well if you collaborate with a successful artist who has a lot of chart toppers yeah, maybe maybe in that sense it was when when you but then the song was already written. It was written quite late in the process. Um, many of these songs for on ours was uh, written in 1998, or or um, maybe not that 98, but at least uh, earlier in, in in the year. And this came uh, uh, quite late in the process after they had uh, already started recording the album, I believe, or recorded some of the songs. And it started from keyboard, keyboard and vocal idea that Bowie had. And uh, he named it Thursday's Child. He um, talked about it, that title several times, or at least two times. One was on, uh, on a Bowie net chat, web chat, in 1999, uh, where he explained the title and influence. And he again repeated that on VH1 Storyteller show when he also played this song. It was, was the very first time that song was played and heard i think as well uh, and he explained that it was, it was inspired by an autobiography by eartha kitt called thursday's child and the image on the cover that had stayed with him since he was about 14 years old or something like that um what he doesn't say is that eartha kitt also recorded a song called thursday's child as well but it was this autobiography that inspired him Another inspiration is said to be uh, uh, an actual nursery rhyme, uh, Danny Kaye's Inchworm. It also has uh, this Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday mentioning. Um, it's actually first performed in a film, Hans Christian Andersen from 1952. Mm. And uh, yeah, I'd say it's not the first time Bowie has used nursery rhyme-like sections in his songs. Thinking here about ashes to ashes, maybe. Mm. Mm. Where it kind of does the same. I think also maybe after all. Yeah. Mm. Could, have, could have been a nursery rhyme like Jingling song. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that too. Also. So he has a couple of times uh, during his career where he has touched upon things like that. Uh, and now we have uh, Nicholas Pegg uh, in. Uh, the complete David Bowie. Right. He um, tends to take all the songs and compare it to 
a lot of other stuff. Um, and uh, he mentions that Velvet Underground also sings in all tomorrow's parties that Thursday's child is Sunday's clown. Yeah. It's a definitely a song mm. that Bowie would have heard. Mm. And according to Nic- Nicholas Pegg, the song also references Ray Charles, Ray Charles, uh, that lucky old son, where uh, Bowie sings, uh, lucky old son is in my sky. And he has mentioned that the song has a resemblance to the Cars' song, Drive. Mm. Okay. Quite struck to hear, but then, and I also mm-hmm. compared it to Bowie's own songs, perhaps closer to the track, Buddha of Suburbia, which I kind of can hear. Yeah, yeah. Mm. has a bit of the same mood. And he also mentions as the world falls down as a certain resemblance. Maybe more bit of suburbia in that case, I would mm. say. Yeah. yeah. Anything to say about the lyrics itself? Well, he has this line, seeing my past to let it go. And um, hearing that uh, lyric and uh, combining it with the cover where, you know, he's yet again shedding skin for a new image and uh, releasing this album the same time he released the remastered CD editions of all his back catalog. My thoughts at the time was, you know, he's uh, taking a new direction again and uh, uh, once again looking back, but now he says he's going to let it go, but of course he will not let it go. It's the same. Uh, Mm. I'm going to retire now and... uh, play my old songs for the last time on the Sound and Vision tour and uh, the last Siggy show we'll ever do. And, you know, this is a, a standard Bowie trick. <laughs> <clears throat> so that lyric, uh, that line gave me this association. But, yeah. uh, yeah. And it is a common theme on, on ours as well. Many of the songs may appear or seem autobiographical to some extent. And, and he has several times uh, rejected that idea saying that it's more uh, of his generation's autobiography, kind of, he's talking on behalf of his whole generation. Mm. Yeah, there are three um, rivers that run together in this album. One of them is the Omicron soundtrack, and another one is the the songs from a middle-aged person's perspective of memory and uh, nostalgia and regret, and uh, but being not himself, but more a generation um, portrait. And the third is, of course, these uh, self-referential things that uh, not all songs, but many of them, like Brilliant Adventure and New Angels of Promise, and they they give us uh, resonances of old Bowie Bowie tracks. And Mm -hmm. uh, this is something that he would just continue uh, on um, even more on the next next albums mm. and of course blurring uh, the lines between autobiography and and character and of course he's always done that mm. and of course uh boy is not a thursday's child he was born on no. a wednesday oh he was he so was. it's a new character as was i <laughs> and i don't mm. think chris here is a thursday's child very well I'm a Tuesday's so this child. Is, this is my theme song. song. <laughs> <laughs> You're a Tuesday's mm. child? Tuesday's child. Yeah. It would sort of have worked. but I think this nursery rhyme, uh, Inchworm, uh, mentions what each each day's child is. <laughs> or something like that. Mm. No. Well, I think one of my favorite Bowie um, shows that was uh, televised was promoting this album i i guess at least but it was in uh, 2000 bbc yeah it's not yeah. exactly promoting this album but um, yeah but it yeah it sort of belongs to kind of belongs to the period. same period yeah, yeah. Mm. and he does not perform this song so i'm wondering was it ever performed much live it i mean the, the hours tours it, itself is very short it's about 12 concerts um, in all and there are four concerts in 2000 12 in 1999 mm. 
in addition to a lot of, of appearances on TV and mm. some of these concerts are sort of borderline proper concerts. They're maybe 10 songs long. Mm. It's not, you know, yeah. 10 song long concert is not the proper concert, I no. would say, but it's definitely longer than an appearance on the TV. Um, so there's several of those. Um, it was first played on VH1 Storytellers. The last time it was played in was 16th of June 2000 in Roseland Ballroom in New York. He played only four concerts in 2000. It was two shows in, in Roseland Ballroom, Glastonbury and the BBC concert mm. that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. But it is a track that didn't survive the hours. It was never tour. performed afterward. It, it was performed 22 times in all. Which meant that it must have been played on almost every show that he did in that period. Yeah. But not mm. afterwards. Yeah. There's actually only one song on ours that was played on the Heathen Tour. Which was? Okay. Uh, Survive, Survive was played a couple mm. of times. Mm. But it is available on a lot of stuff. I mean, nothing has changed. As you mentioned, Legacy, another uh, um, compilation album. VH1 Storytellers came out with this song on it. Uh, there are two live versions, both from 1999, Something in the Air, which came in uh, about 20, 20, 2021, I think, mm -hmm. and, uh, at the Kit Kat Club, which also came around the same time and was recorded around the same time. So uh, it has quite a lot of releases and yeah, three different live versions. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, there was a music video for it. Directed by Walter Stern, who, amongst other things, did Firestarter for Prodigy, for example. <laughs> this is quite different, <laughs> but uh, but it really suits the um, theme of the song. It's mm. uh, it's quite a memorable video. It features Bowie in a motel room, looking at the younger self, sort of reflecting the theme on the cover mm. of the album. Both the younger and the older self. Mm. Like, mm. Yeah, both those videos are. They're slow. Uh, I mean, with both, I mean, Survive and Thursday's Child, both are old to stern. Mm. Um, they're slow and they're sort of suburban. He sits at the kitchen table and he's in the bathroom brushing his teeth. And <laughs> um, I think that's, uh, I think they're, they're connected in that they are, have sort of anti rock star image boy as a. Completely ordinary guy doing ordinary stuff, which he will continue on the Stars Are Out Tonight video, for instance. And in a way, you can say there are two videos of it because there is a video section in the game Omicron and Nomad Soul where the band uh, that Bowie plays in in the, in the game alongside Reeves Cabrals and Galen Dorsey, the Dreamers, are performing this uh, song, First of Child. That's very cool. Mm. It was a very enjoyable experience, mm. I remember, when, uh, <laughs> back in 1999 when I was playing this game. <laughs> now I wonder if it's still playable. I, I do have it somewhere yeah. on, on a CD, but uh, I couldn't find it. I was planning mm. to show the whole... It came in, you know, back, back in the days when games came in a big box. Mm. Yeah. Cardboard box. Uh, yeah, um, the song was released on single, as mentioned, and there are a lot of versions of the single. There are four uh, that was out for sale, plus two promo singles, so six singles, one could say. Uh, so there were two British ones, and they are maybe the most interesting ones. First one of those had the radio edits, about a minute shorter, and two B-sides, We All Go Through and No One Calls. Are those the ones we're looking at here, Chris? Mm -hmm. They look quite the same. Identical. <laughs> <laughs> Might be an international one and a UK one, I have yeah. I think. Mm. So it's the, the, sec mm. the second single has the rock mix instead of the, the radio edit, as we talked about. We mm. shall go to Tallinn in 1917. And also the video in a quick time format. Uh -huh. So, yeah. The quick time days. And these B-sides, uh, they were uh, partly... Uh, had been instrumentals, and there are the titles for the uh, 1917. 
uh, it was a fight scene instrumental on Omicron and uh, No One Calls was another instrumental mm -hmm. and um, uh, We All Go Through was the end credits song mm. on Omicron. Uh, we Shall Go To Town I don't think is on Omicron at all. No. It's only in the... It's recorded and not included on the album basically. And, um, I and I know, I know Rizka Brals was disappointed. I'm not sure if it was We All Go Through or We Shall Go To Town. The titles are so similar, I confused them. But there was one of them that he would have really liked to have on the album. It's mm. We Shall Go To Town. Um, he's quoted somewhere, and Chris O'Leary possibly, that uh, he thought that was an, a major track, and he was really disappointed that that was axed and put on the B-side. Mm. So... One of the drops that made the glass run over for him. Okay, maybe if we have time, we will take a listen to that track later. Mm -hmm. you know, I think it's superior to much of the album. Uh, I, I would say that it's four very good and interesting B-sides. Yes, mm. not too fond of 1917. Uh, that's it. Yeah, you can hear it once, and that's uh, <laughs> then you heard it. But the other three, uh, I think would have uh, vastly better the album if they were included mm -hmm. on cost of some else or maybe some shortening of the other songs mm -hmm. because they are more experimental and they would uh, have uh, made it a more interesting uh, album as a whole in, in my opinion mm. I actually put it in my notes here we shall go to town Gabras described it as a dark track about two grotesquely disfigured people. <laughs> yeah, so the the two other international singles, they're not quite as, simp as interesting. Uh, international one is very similar to the second British version, the one that had the rock mix, but it has the radio edit instead, but otherwise it's identical. And then uh, the, the second version only had the radio edit and the rock mix, none of the interesting B-sides. Um, yeah, single reached number 16 on UK singles chart, which isn't too bad, but uh, I guess for Bowie it could have been better. It was nominated for a Grammy Awards in the category Best Male Rock Vocal Performance, but he lost to Lenny Kravitz and the song Again. Anybody remembers that one? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Probably if I heard it. Again. Yep. Maybe again. Yeah. It would hear it again. Mm. Yeah, and uh, uh, Rolling Stones once listed the song at number five on their list called 20 Insanely Great David Bowie Songs Only Hardcore Fans Know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Mm. Yeah. They're probably right about that. I can imagine it's not a song that uh, a lot of people outside the Bowie core would know too well. Mm. Any final words? No. No. And we'll just leave it there. Thank you to everyone who was watching us. Uh, we will be back shortly with the next track on uh, ours, Something in the Air. And until then, you must have a good day. Good day. See you in a bit. <laughs>